Welcome to our webinar today, hosted by the City of Berkeley. Uh, our partnership uh, allows us to be able to provide services to Berkeley businesses, but we also work nationwide. Uh, and if you are from out of the area, whether in Southern California or out of state, we have services all over. So please connect with us and we'd love to help you in your exploration of employee ownership. Without further ado, let's get started. Now that's me, Miyaka Cochran. I'm a business engagement and partnership manager here at Project Equity. And I help by advising businesses who are wanting to explore these options. So providing information, education, and also feedback about how employee ownership uh, may or may not meet your goals. And we're here to uh, help you uh, make sure that you look at these options, no matter whether you're planning to sell your business and retire, or if you're looking for options to unlock benefits of employee ownership in other ways, happy to speak with you. All right, so Project Equity. What we do is we help business owners um, secure their company's legacies by transitioning to employee ownership. Um, this process really is a win-win-win for everyone involved. We see the impact it has on the workers, which is often well known um, about the benefits of employee ownership, but it's also incredibly powerful in sustaining high quality jobs and keeping businesses rooted in the communities. And you see in particular with Berkeley, there are some very powerful cooperatives in the area such as Arizmendi and uh, the Cheese Board um, and Alchemy Coffee, uh, numerous others um, that really have been able to utilize these models to help provide high quality jobs that provide good pay um, and good profit sharing for the employees, as well as sustaining those businesses and keeping them rooted and serving the communities that they're in. We're here to help support that. We're a national nonprofit, but we are based right out of Oakland in our headquarters. And I myself am in the East Bay in Richmond. So what kind of businesses do we actually work with? Well, all of them, that's the short answer. From small local shops to multi-state corporations, employee ownership, models can be applicable and beneficial to all industries and all sizes of businesses where most commonly a lot of people associate cooperatives with you know a, a bakery a pizzeria a grocery store but they're really powerful models across manufacturing industry um, distribution and um, science and technology as well so we really work with all of these industries and um, help them unlock the benefits that will be unique for their specific business. Now, why the time is now for employee ownership? Why is this the moment where we can use employee ownership more than ever? And that's because we're in the middle of what we call a twin small business crisis. Uh, we really need decisive action here to preserve California businesses. As we can see, you know, the big elephant in the room for everyone right now is COVID-19 with uh, multiple openings and closures um, affecting almost 80% of businesses in California. And over half, you know, really see more than six months needed to return to normal. Um, and this is, this is very detrimental both to job security for workers, but also being able to keep businesses open and serving the communities. In addition to that, we are in the midst of what's commonly referred to as the silver tsunami. Uh, baby boomers actually uh, own more than half of independent businesses that employ workers in the country right now. Um, and with this, most of them are at retirement age or about to be right now. Um, and so we are in the middle of the, really the biggest uh, ownership transfer in the country's history in terms of independent business. And we really want to make sure that we're preserving these businesses, making them uh, make sure that there's a path forward to stay in the communities and keeping those jobs um, as well. So the silver tsunami, as I said, um, as you can see through this, this, uh, this graphic here, right now, um, just even as last year, we are at the, the upward swing. Now, th this type of trajectory is what you would want to see if you're in one of those tech startups, <laughs> but not with where we are with independent business. Um, this is why it's critical that we are addressing the needs for business owners. 
Berkeley specifically, uh, there's a need for succession planning um, because we want to we want to ensure that there's sustainable local the, the the local economy is sustained here. We have, for example, over uh, 1,200 businesses in Berkeley are more than 20 years old, and that accounts for 1.6 billion of small business revenue. That's really uh, remarkable, and these businesses actually um, employ one in three workers in the area. So it's it's really to show that it's very important to be able to make sure that we are connecting with businesses and uh, speaking with them to ensure that regardless of the path that they are, uh, they have a path forward to continue to serve the community and stay rooted in there because we don't want to see businesses close. Uh, in addition to this, what we see is working people are just not economically secure. When you look at the data here, um, nearly half of U.S. families cannot manage a $400 emergency expense. This is, of course, amplified by the current situation with COVID-19, in which we also are seeing a high unemployment rate. Um, and if you look at six of 10 fastest growing occupations uh, in the country right now, they pay less than 27,000 a year. And if you're here in the Bay Area, you know that that's gonna be a big challenge to live on. Now, employee ownership also produces greater stability during crises, um, even than emergency government spending. Um, this is really interesting and some, some, new, some new data that we wanna share with you. Uh, first of all, the majority ESOP firms, which we will talk about a little bit later, that's one form of employee ownership. Um, they outperform other, biz, other, uh, other competitive firms um, at retaining jobs by a four to one rate. Um, in addition to this, the majority ESOP companies uh, maintain standard hours and salaries at significantly higher rates than others during the pandemic. And when we look at the, uh, the long-term public policy uh, with encouragement of employee ownership, um, this produces greater job stability during a crisis um, than even emergency spending. Protecting the businesses and the workers is a joint effort. And by doing both, you can really ensure the businesses and workers are taken care of and um, are able to weather the storm. And when we're getting into some of the challenges of selling a business, if an owner is retiring or ready to move on, it's, it's really not easy. With only 20% of businesses that are up for sale ever find a buyer. Um, and one of the things that's significantly changed um, in the past 100 years is the reduction of transition within families. So moving on to children or the next generation, about only 15% transition within the families currently. Um, and that puts one in five businesses at risk of closing. There are some reasons why this is important. And I wanna cover this here, which is the succession options for your business. Now, when you're looking at selling to a private buyer, um, it's, it's uncertain in terms of the acquisition price, if you're gonna receive a market value, um, if it's going to preserve the legacy, what that private buyer is going to do with the business, um, whether it's a roll-up or they're buying to just dominate the market and plan to, you know, strip it for parts and, and close down operations. Um, and the future for their employees is uncertain as well. Selling to family members is a great option for preserving the legacy um, that doesn't necessarily translate into a market value either, depending on the, the equity that they have and ability to uh, purchase that business from you. Um, the tax benefits are uncertain. And again, in terms of how the employees are connected to that future, the business is unknown. But employee ownership really covers all the boxes. And so you're able to get a fair sale price. Uh, you're able to preserve the legacy. There's tax benefits involved, um, potentially both for the selling owner and the business itself moving forward. And it's a fantastic way to retain those employees and make sure that their jobs are secured. Um, we also see people doing combinations. And so we have a number of businesses who come to us with family members who are in leadership positions at the business already, but they don't want to take the full burden of ownership. And so for them, they actually see this as a great option where, you know, perhaps your children want to still remain leaders in the business, but they don't want the full burden of ownership and they want to share that. Um, so they're still able to participate in profit sharing, um, but have, um, you know, have either a, you know, more of a work-life balance or ability to do some other work on the side as well. 
Now, the best kept secrets of employee ownership, we have a few of those that I want to share with you. Now, first of all, we, we really see uh, remarkably that profit margins um, in comparison to peers are on average 8.5% higher. There's a combination of reasons behind that, but these are competitive business models, and it's something that's not as well known as the benefits to the employees. So in addition to that, with higher profit margins, you see sales growth and employment growth. Um, these are some of the reasons that tax benefits can be available to these types of business models is because of the hard data that's showing the benefits to the employees, the business, and the community. You also see fewer layoffs as we covered during the pandemic at a four to one rate with ESOPs, even outside of the pandemic. And this, uh, this data set shows that when you look at an employee owned company on average is going to have a higher retention rate of employee ownership. Um, so you can see just fewer layoffs. There's also better wages. This is one of the things that's more commonly known about employee ownership is the benefit to the employees this is really powerful and impactful in people's lives, um, providing frontline workers, especially with, with ways to grow their, um, gr grow their generational wealth. And that money is staying in the community as well. Now, the unique benefits of employee buyouts is, you know, first and foremost, for the owner, you can achieve a fair sale price. You're not necessarily having to sacrifice a good sales price to sell to your employees. Um, the owner is able to retain influence on the pacing and exit timeline. And so if they want to phase out, um, they're able to create a path to do so um, and make a smoother transition. There are also ways for them to exit more quickly operationally, but still uh, remain in touch or remain in a position where they can provide guidance. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you really are able to preserve the unique culture the, the workforce and the assets that make this business successful in the first place. Now, without further ado, let's get into the actual nuts and bolts of what are these employee ownership business models. So I'd like to start by giving an overview. We have three primary forms of broad-based employee ownership. What, we, what I mean by broad-based is that means that the majority of the, of the workforce is going to be participating in ownership versus just selling your business to you know, a small management team, for example. One of the bigger forms is called an employee stock ownership plan or ESOP. They are retirement plans that own all or part of the company on behalf of its employees. So the profits of the, of the company are going into retirement plan with the, uh, with, with the workers being the beneficiaries. The other one is worker cooperatives. Now this is, you know, when you look at the city of Berkeley, you see um, uh, the cheese board cooperative, Arizmendi, Alchemy Coffee, as I spoke about before. Um, and these are wholly owned by the employee owners who share in profits and they're able to elect or even have the ability to serve on a board of directors, which helps uh, govern that entity. Now, the last one, which is uh, much less common, is employee ownership trust. This is a, a highly customizable form of employee ownership that can be adapted to incorporate democratic principles and it has profit sharing built in. The difference in this is that similar to an ESOP, the, the company is actually owned by a trust which provides uh, beneficiaries, the, the workers as beneficiaries. So let's get into a little bit of the details here. So ESOPs. ESOPs are great for companies that are larger uh, because they're much more expensive to set up and they have uh, ongoing administration fees as well. So we see really the sweet spot is 40 plus employees for ESOPs. Um, there's, there's massive tax relief for the company in these and it's tax positive for the selling owner. Uh, we can get into the details on that. And if you are a large company or are working with a large company that you'd like to advise on, um, this is something we can get more detailed on in more of a one-on-one -on -one call, um, but there's a lot of tax positive aspects of ESOPs. Um, as I said, there is a higher setup and ongoing cost, so it's a measurement of the tax benefits versus that cost, um, but it's free to employees. There's employees are not able, uh, uh, don't have to buy into it, 
Um, and there's options for employees to have governance roles where you can incorporate some of the cooperative structures and principles uh, into an ESOP. Uh, they are re qualified retirement plans. Not only are they like a 401k, but they're actually governed by the same uh, body um, that the 401ks are. And so it's used to transfer all or part of the company's shares to a trust, which is administ administrated on behalf of the employees uh, to, uh, into a retirement plan. So moving on, the next one is worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, one of the most widely known forms of worker ownership and it's good we see for about 10 plus employees is a good sweet spot for uh, worker-owned cooperatives as well. Um, and um, there's democratic governance built in. So a board of directors is elected. Each employee uh, has one vote and 95% of what they'd ever vote on would be board seats. And so the board of, uh, the board of directors uh, governs the business and works with uh, management and leadership uh, who then in turn oversees operations and employees. So it creates a really a, a circle of accountability there that um, provides a lot of uh, healthy synergy for the business. Um, it's very equitable. It's less expensive to set up. There are some great tax benefits that come with it. There's an equity stake for the employees who are able to participate in profit sharing. Um, and it's, it's, it's really one of the most fantastic methods to unlock uh, deeper employee engagement in the business and reward people for the hard per work that they're putting in, as well as for an exiting owner to ensure that their legacy is preserved. Now, the last uh, one to cover again is employee ownership trust. This is a model that started um, in the United Kingdom um, and is much more prominent in Europe currently. However, it is um, gaining more awareness and uh, starting to become more common here because of its flexibility. Um, we do, similarly to a co-op, we recommend having at least 10 employees with a trust. Um, and the, the difference between a co-op is that it's actually owned by a trust with the employees of the beneficiaries. So really you can think of it, an EOT as um, an option that kind of sits between a cooperative and an ESOP. You can really make it design to look more like one or the other, um, or a combination of both. Uh, the, the downside from that is that there are few, if any, tax advantages. So it does, um, you know, you're trading in the customization for, um, you know, for lack of, of tax advantages that come along with co-ops and ESOPs, but it is free to employees and there is built-in profit sharing. One of the unique benefits about employee trusts also is that it helps protect the business itself. And so they're um, built into a trust is that it is perpetual, meaning that it will always exist to serve the, the benefit of the employees. So it, it helps prevent the business from being acquired uh, in the future. And so if you're a business owner that's wanting to ensure that that business remains owned by the employees uh, for the benefit of the employees, and that is perhaps mission uh, is, is preserved, this is a great option to explore. Now, before we move on, I just wanna also remind that I will be taking questions at the end. So please pull up the questions tab if you have some burning questions that you'd like to ask, um, and we will select some good questions at the end to ask live. All right, so now I'd like to give some examples, uh, some local examples here in Berkeley. So this is a company that we worked with, Adams and Chittenden. They're a scientific glass manufacturer. Um, and it, this was a really interesting uh, case in which we had owners who really didn't see how they could sell to another uh, private buyer, that they were deeply passionate and involved in their business. You can see even from the, the photo as they're carefully examining this, um, this scientific glass bottle that they're holding, um, that the, that level of involvement and passion was, was needed and having a passive owner um, who is just collecting, you know, collecting profit over time just wasn't really feasible. Um, and, you know, the thought of even finding someone to buy them out that would be interesting, that would be interested just seemed, you know, improbable to them. And so, once they discovered the idea of employee ownership, uh, it really became a no-brainer for them. And they, they really found a great deal of excitement. The employees were passionate about what they did. Um, and it really helped create not only uh, a way for the business to continue and a, an exit option for the owners, 
um, but also a way to strengthen and empower that business to make it even stronger in the future. Um, another one, and this is in the in the South Bay, is a slice of New York pizza. Uh, this is a really powerful example because for those of you in the Bay Area, realize that you know San Jose and Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, you know this is this is that Silicon Valley area that is notorious for high cost of living, um, and they are facing problems as an area. Uh, having uh, frontline workers and service industry workers specifically um, be able to make a living wage and live in the area. Um, some needing to commute from very far and others having to, you know, share rooms and, you know, live in RVs and everything like that. And so it's, it's, it's a very challenge, it's a very big challenge in the area, but a slice of New York pizza um, was a successful pizzeria in the area. And after transitioning to a cooperative, they were actually able to distribute more than $600,000 of profits to which 35 employees just in the first two years after transition. Um, this is incredibly impactful to the workers. Um, and you can see the smiles on their faces here. These are people who really love what they do. They, they love making pizza and serving pizza to the community. And it provides them a path to have a job that they love and are passionate about um, while providing um, compensation that allows them to just even uh, survive in the area. So really powerful example there. Um, and um, and there, there's numerous others in the Bay as well, such as if you're just going on the pizza front to Zachary's, which is an ESOP um, that has uh, locations here in Berkeley as well as uh, throughout the East Bay. Now, let's take a break here. There's been plenty of information Let's do a little challenge. So I want to see what you've picked up, what you know. So just follow along and answer the questions to yourself and see how well you do. Now we'll start with question one. True or false? Selling to employees requires accepting a lower selling price. What's the answer? The answer, of course, is false. A fair sales price is established by debt capacity analysis, a method of providing a fair sales price um, that's both gonna give the business the best chance in, uh, in the future, as well as providing an equitable exit for the owner. Question two, true or false, employees are going to have to foot the bill. Are employees gonna have to pay out of pocket for these transactions? The answer is false. Employees are actually not obligated to finance the transaction. And usually it's done through a leveraged buyout with the business taking out a loan to pay out of future revenue. With the co-op, there is a small buy-in from the employees, um, but it's, it's nominal and um, within reach for all workers. Now, question three, we have true or false. Owners can remain involved in strategic direction after they sell. This is a question that's uh, on a lot of folks' minds, um, particularly owners who don't necessarily want to exit fully, but maybe want a little bit more time on the beach or the golf course, course um, or with their family. And that answer is true. Um, selling owners have number of options to stay involved with the business, including remaining in their current position, serving as a board member, or taking the opportunity to shift their role uh, and either to part-time or something full-time that's a little bit different to make a path for new leaders within the business. Last but not least, we have question four, true or false, all employees will be managing the business equally. Largely, this is a misconception because that is false. So management would actually be in place to ensure a robust structure. If you have a successful business, you don't necessarily want to take the transition to a cooperative to, to change everything that made it successful. Uh, having management is very important um, in a business and whatever form that takes. And there are ways to explore ideas such as participatory management, open book management, and other ways to include employees to provide more uh, inclusivity. Um, but having strong leadership is important. Now, what is an employee ownership transition? We've covered a little bit of the models and danced around a little bit on what the actual transition is, but when we look at the nuts and bolts of it, it is a sale of a business to a new entity. So let's say you're forming a cooperative, a cooperative entity is established, and that new entity um, takes out a loan um, to buy out the old entity, and then that's paid over time through future profits. 
Most transitioned businesses retain their same executives and management, um, and then often with employee owners electing or serving on a board of directors. Whoops, moving ahead a little bit too fast. Okay, so how does this actually work? Well, first, the sale price and deal terms are finalized. Then the transitioned employee-owned business obtains a loan, and then that loan is paid off through future revenue. How is that financed? Now, the financing, um, we can go through a bank or a CDFI, which is a community development financial institution or community development fund have, have funds for these types of transitions. Um, and we also see the owner um, generally also participating in the finance on average between about 30 or 50 percent. What this means is let's say that the bank is paying 60 percent. That means that the owners will get their payment of the 60 percent of the sales price at the time of sale. And then the owner will be repaid that 40 percent over between a five and eight year time span. Um, this gives the owner an ability to um, uh, participate in the interest of that loan as well um, and uh, gives them more flexibility for getting a little bit liquidity now and some over time. And, um, and then in a cooperative example, the, uh, the employees have a buy-in, which is a small amount, can generally be between $100 and $5,000, whatever you want to establish there. And that can even be taken out uh, in pieces over future paychecks. So even in that scenario, um, the employees still don't have to pay out of pocket. Now the advantages here um, are a few fold. First of all, as we spoke about that market price, you get a fair price from a debt capacity analysis. It delivers significant tax advantages in the form of ESOP or co-ops, both the owner and the business can benefit from. The owner is able to control the process. So you really drive the sale, the timing and the process. Um, and then there's also support for flexible financing because the owner has the ability to participate in portion or completely finance themselves, it gives the most flexibility for those terms. Um, and then as we've spoken about before, it really strengthens local economies. The profits of this business are gonna go back into the community um, through the workers and really strengthens both their um, familial income um, as well as the, the local economy. Now, how transitions actually work? How do we do it here? And what's the most common way that it's done in the industry? Now, here's our transition process. So first, what we start out with is an exploration. Um, are you curious to learn about how employee ownership can fit your needs? Uh, this takes the form of our free business advisory calls um, that we're offering to you in part because of funding from the city of Berkeley. And we can just have a conversation, learn about your business, your personal goals, and how employee ownership may fit about that. And I can advise especially about, you know, what type of uh, entity or transition could be beneficial for that and give you feedback on whether your timing is, is good and if you're right for an employee ownership transition or be honest if there's, um, if it's really not a fit, can we can help you um, through that process of exploration. Um, and then we get to the point where we're estimating that this is viable and you're very interested in, in going further, we'd enter into our feasibility phase, which is a three to four month deep dive on employee ownership. Um, and we're really gonna basically create a straw model or a blueprint of your business as employee ownership, including that debt capacity analysis to establish a range of sales prices um, based on different financing scenarios um, so that you should have all the information you need um, as well as some initial engagement with your employee base to gauge interest readiness there. Um, at that point, if you're ready to transition, we can move into our transition phase or you can come back to us in a year. We also have a number of businesses who go through our feasibility, learn a lot, and then take a year to really kind of build up some processes and, and maybe build revenue to get a better sales price um, over the course of a year. Um, and then when we're ready to transition, um, you can sign a, an agreement for our transition services. So this is about a nine month process. And what we do is we really go through and develop the financing with you. Um, we engage and train the employees on employee ownership uh, and do any management transition uh, support for you as well. So if you as an owner are um, leaving, uh, do you need to uh, hire from within, promote with, from within or 
distribute your role amongst uh, a few people, or is there a need to actually bring in someone from the outside to take over for you in that particular role? Uh, at the end of this, what we do is we'll close the sale. Uh, all the bylaws are, are outlined for the for the employee-owned entity. Sign all the sign all the documents and get paid for the finance portion. Uh, and then one unique thing about our process is that we have a, what's called our Thrive program, where we will stay with that business for up to two years to continue to provide support and guidance. So we'll have a dedicated person that's available. Um, and you know for things such as when you have new board members um, elected to do some training there or onboarding of new um, employees um, to help uh, you know help maintain these uh, standards and help make sure that the company and the employees are really continuing to thrive as the new entity now the feasibility as i spoke about a little bit i want to kind of double click down in there with a the magnifying glass and what we want to do during this is conduct the debt capacity analysis to establish business sale viability and sale price ceiling. So what's what's the highest we can get um, that's going to work for everyone involved. And then as appropriate, we'll support initial employee engagement. Some businesses really want to bring in, you know, some or all the employees into this process. Um, and some owners prefer to do this still behind closed doors and make sure that um, there's there's clarity and and um, enough information to move forward before bringing in the employees. So we'll follow the owner's lead on that. And then we understand the, the possible future management scenarios. As I mentioned, any management transition is needed. And then um, this all culminates in the development of a strong model of the company. So you really can see top to bottom what the company is going to look like, what the sale will look like. Um, and what that will mean for the owner financially and also for the debt carried forward by the business. Employee ownership readiness factor. So if you're looking at all of this and saying, you know, gee, this is, this is really ideal for what I'm looking for, here's some key things to look out for in terms of what are good benchmarks. Um, there's, there's no real formula here. Each business is unique, but here are some good benchmarks to think about. You know, is, is the company profitable? Is it in good financial health? um for the past five years now this is important in terms of establishing the sale price but also being able to take on some debt to repay in the future are there experienced employees you know we really see 10 plus employees being a good uh, starting point for worker co-ops and uh, employee ownership trusts and then 40 plus employees for esops and you know within that you really want to kind of identify a you know, at least a handful of employees that you feel like would be a good core starting team. Um, it could be, depending on the size of the company, it could be, you know, two, three, four, five, eight employees, depending. Um, and those can uh, often take uh, take the form of the starting board um, until the first board election, or just people to bring in the process to help uh, provide feedback and guidance for you as well. Um, now, lastly, is the proven track record. You really want to see businesses who have, you know, good years of experience, um, either showing, you know, steady revenue or growing revenue over time. Um, this really positions the business to have the best um, likelihood to continue to be operational and grow in the future. Now, in terms of uh, employee ownership transitions that may meet your needs, here are some common statements or questions that we get and if you find yourself uh, saying any of these things to yourself um, we have some answers for you we we have owners who really want to preserve what they've built and see it thrive in this case selling to employees uh, preserves the culture and operations that really helps make that business strong or maybe you want to make sure that you take care of your employees and that they are compensated and and cared for in your departure if that's the case, um, employee ownership really fits the bill in terms of providing a share of the success of the business through profit sharing, rewarding them for the work that they're putting into the business. Or maybe it's simple that you're doubtful or have struggled to find a buyer. Um, the employees really have the qualifying experience and can purchase through, via a leveraged buyout, so they're not having to pay out of pocket, which is really great. And then maybe you want to remain involved, but you're ready for someone else to take the reins or to start to phase out over time. Employee ownership offers a great way to remain involved and slowly phase out so that you're not having to, to you know, cut the, cut the cord and leave all at once. 
Um, it allows you to share the weight and workload of ownership um, while being able to still remain involved. And if you're remaining an employee, still take uh, participate in profit sharing. Now, we'd love to speak with you. So we offer our free business advisory uh, calls. Again, um, in, in part in, in big thanks to the city of Berkeley um, for their funding partnership with us. Uh, and to do this, just go to projectequity.org. You also have my email um, attached to this webinar, so feel free to just drop me an email um, and I'd be happy to schedule a time with you. Um, and this you, we can do if you wanna just have general information, you know, a Q&A of how it works more. If you're not necessarily serious about this yet, that's totally fine. Or if you just have questions from this webinar that you'd like to discuss more, be happy to, to chat with you. Um, or maybe you're a little bit more serious and you really want to um, grill these options in terms of how they may meet your goals. I can help you navigate that, um, provide some feedback about pros and cons based on what you're trying to achieve. Um, or if you've already decided, yeah, this is great, this is what I wanna do and you're trying to figure it out, I can work with you on those readiness factors. So we can go over some financial points and we can go over some management and employee details to really help figure out what are the next steps for you and what's gonna be best to get you there. So we'd love to chat with you, um, take advantage of our free business advisory calls. Um, we have myself and, and a team of wonderful business engagement managers um, able to answer your questions and, and help you figure it out. Now, uh, I just wanna say again, thank you to, um, to the city of Berkeley and Karen Slaughter for hosting us and providing us a platform to share our work with you and, and help support uh, Berkeley businesses, and I'd love to get some questions. So let me go ahead and pop up my camera again so you can see my face. And we'll so get into Miyaka, some Q&A. Miyaka, we have, we have kind of a shy group here, but uh, one of the questions is, what if, we're, what if you're not a business? How does mm -hmm. what you taught us today, how can you carry it along or how can you recommend it if you're a business connector or you're someone that a, a business owner consults on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, you know, one of our missions, uh, core missions is to demonstrate and replicate um, a successful employee ownership. And so we work with a number of different business advisors from wealth planners to exit planners, uh, business bankers, business brokers, and we can really be your partner in terms of helping you understand and make sure that employee ownership is an option you can include in your toolkit as offerings to your clients. And so we can really be either that background partner that's really helping support your work and, and uh, training you, and we can also work directly with your clients in collaboration with you to help explore these options. Um, the benefit for us of being a nonprofit is we're really here to try to provide the easiest path as we can for people. And so we're gonna be a great option for, great and low cost option for uh, business uh, advisors to help us, um, to, to help their clients explore these options. You had a slide early on that talked about the different types of businesses that Project Equity works with. Mm -hmm. uh, Genevieve asked uh, whether we have experience with small businesses. Can you kind of give us an example of, of when somebody signs up for a consultation with you, is it different mm -hmm. if you're a small business versus a medium sized business or a large business? That's a great question. Um, the answer is that we do work with businesses large and small. Um, you know, with with small, with very small businesses or micro businesses, such as um, uh, you know businesses with only maybe two to three workers, there's way to there's ways to unlock employee ownership and make that path. Um, and we can advise. It's generally going to be a little bit more of a DIY approach, <laughs> um, because when you're that small, um, it makes sense to do something um, much more simple and straightforward and uh, give you a path to grow your employee owned business, um, but it's not necessarily going to be something that you're gonna do, you know, very in-depth employee engagement with as you would with a company with 100 employees, for example. So we also partner with um, other organizations and nonprofits who specialize in um, micro businesses or very small businesses. Um, and so we're a great entrance point for any business who's interested in exploring these options. And, um, and we can advise on the best, best path forward and even connect you with somebody who um, might work with uh, specialize in, in a smaller micro business. Um, when somebody comes to you for a consultation, do, have you, have, do you have any examples of 
somebody that came, um, you know, well prepared or unprepared? Is there some advice that you would give to a business owner uh, before they make a consultation with you, so that that you can have a really nice conversation and determine if employee ownership is the path they should take? Yes. Well, I can say that you're you're never too underprepared. <laughs> um, you know, the reason I say this is because there's there's a lot of information here. And, you know, it's not worth stressing yourself out or trying to come to this consultation, you know, with all your finances in order and a full perspective on everything. Really, I can help you navigate some of those questions. And, you know, even if the consultation just uh, results in you really understanding sort of what you need to look into further, that's going to be helpful and we can do a follow up. And so, you know, there's no reason that we can't do a consultation and I can uh, get to know you and your business more and your goals and um, give you some advice that we can revisit in a couple of weeks or a month. And uh, once you uh, do a little bit more looking and working and thinking, um, and that, that's very common. We, we very commonly speak to businesses that need time to digest some of the information and then come back and have an even fuller conversation. Uh, Krista asked a, a really good question about, mm -hmm. you know, we're in COVID times. And a yeah. lot of businesses, their business is down. So should they wait to consider employee ownership so that they could recover a little bit better? Is, or does that matter at all? That's that's a very good question. Um, and I would say that it, it really depends on the specifics of your situation. We have helped businesses um, use employee ownership transitions actually as a way to, to help kind of navigate through these times. Um, and it can be helpful to have a plan set in. Um, and we've advised other businesses to wait where we've done some consultation and we've given some information of, of key things to think about. Um, and then we, you know, we have a scheduled time to, to meet back in six months or a year from now to check back in. So we love to keep in touch with businesses um, to, to follow along. Um, but there are some unique ways that you can actually take advantage of an employee ownership transition to um, gain access to some additional resources. Um, to be able to uh, to help your business during this time as well. Can you expand on those uh, those additional resources? Yes. So, well, the um, you know the the best answer is that we should talk about it a little bit more specific because um, the there are resources in terms of potential continuity funding um, that can be uh, that can be looked into. So, um, being able to potentially work towards employee ownership. Um, but be able to have the work towards employee ownership or commitment to employee ownership, um, gain access to potential uh, funding to help float during these times. Um, so it's one of those things that, you know, it really depends on the details of the business. Um, and so it's better to, to get involved in that in a one-on-one -on -one discussion so I can speak more, uh, more in depth about potential options. Um, but even, uh, even the city of Berkeley has some, some great uh, potential options to, to help businesses um, during these times. And so, you know, even if even if it's not the time for you, um, doing a consultation is just a great time to touch base so I can, um, in the very least, help understand what your needs are and, uh, you know, get you connected with the City of Berkeley or ourselves or another organization that may have resources to help you, regardless if you're trying to transition to employee ownership now or not. Do you have any advice for the business owner once once they determine, hey, this is an this is a really nice business platform that I want to consider. How do they approach their employees? What should they be prepared for? Well, that's 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 an excellent question. Um, I would say that you know, commonly, actually, what we see is employees often have um, uh, concerns initially. So it's it's very common for you to bring up, hey, you know, what about having a, a co-op or an employee-owned business um, transition? and you'll get employees bring up concerns. And we actually see those concerns as positive rather than negative. Because if employees are already thinking about why something wouldn't work for the business, they already have an engagement and care about that business. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of misconceptions about employee ownership. And so one of the most common things we hear from employees in that initial engagement is, well, I don't wanna be an owner. I don't wanna to have to deal with like the finances and all this paperwork and da 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 da, right? But in the reality is for most workers, um, their work is not going to change. You know, in a co-op situation, they will have a vote and they'll be able to vote on a board member on a board seat, but they themselves aren't necessarily going to need to 
um, take on a bunch of extra work, which is one of the most common concerns for the employees. Um, the other being also the belief that they're going to have to pay out of pocket for it and that they are going to, you know, have money on the line. Um, and while you do have a small buy-in um, when you are a worker owner joining a co-op, you also get that back when you leave. And so the risk there is, is, is you know, next to nothing. And uh, once we clear up these uh, questions for employees, we actually have not yet found uh, a case in which we engage the employees um, and that they didn't come around once they learned more about it. And so one of the parts of our services is actually providing um, a way to engage the employees, either with us or even creating custom materials um, for you and your business that you can share. So like a little one pager of, hey, we're exploring employee ownership. This is what it means. We'd love to, to hear your feedback and ways to do that in a way that's gonna be positive, promote good discussion and get you the feedback that you need to really uh, evaluate this option. And Miyaka, as a, as a business owner or, or a business advisor that's on the call today, mm -hmm. um, where are other resources they could look at, you know, if, if this piques their interest and, and they want to do a little bit more background research, where would they find that? Yeah. So um, on our website, we actually have a number of great white papers and case studies. And so, you know, whether you want something that's super in-depth that really goes through the whole scope of a cooperative transition, or you just want uh, an article about a comparable business, um, something that, that you see that you can compare yourself to and, you know, hear quotes from the owners about what they learned, um, that, is a, that is a great way to, to learn about it as well. Um, and there's also a number of great uh, other organizations. There's the National Cooperative Business Association, and they have, you know, themselves. We're actually going to be doing a webinar with them as well um, in March, and they're a nonprofit as well, and, and a great organization on the national level that maybe doesn't have as much, um, you know, uh, involved in like transition work that we do, but great resources that support cooperative businesses um, and great articles and information as well. Well, I don't see any more questions. Is there anything else you want to do address the group? No, I think the last thing I would just say is that, you know, regardless of, of why you came to the webinar today, I'd love to speak with you. I'd love to hear from you. And, and um, so drop me an email uh, or, um, you know, book a, book a call with me for a consultation. I'd love to hear about either your business or, you know, what your interest is in employee ownership, um, no matter if you're a business owner or advisor or just someone who's curious about employee ownership, I'd love to speak with you and um, look forward to connecting and uh, helping you on your journey. And remind people again, how do they connect with you? Yeah, so you can actually um, email me directly. Uh, my name, miyaka at project-equity.org, which is in the, the registration for the um, uh, should be in the, the, your email if you registered for this webinar. You can also go to project.equity.org um, and uh, book a consult as well. Um, so either way, uh, we're here to help you. Thank you, Miyaka. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Um, and thanks again to the City of Berkeley for hosting us for this uh, webinar.